Hello, and welcome to Talk Junkie. My name is Justin Perkins. Um, today's going to be a solo cast. It's just going to be me. Um, be sure to, if you're getting this show on YouTube, to go to iTunes, subscribe, download, rank it, give it a rating, something. If you don't like it, give it a one, whatever. If you're getting this on iTunes, try to go to YouTube uh, and check it out on YouTube and get it there. I'm still currently under the let's get this thing going without social media thing, even though I did notice that my Spreaker account is linked to a page that only has like a hundred and some people on it on Facebook, so it does kind of notify people when I put one up. Um, I just noticed that the other day through kind of the setup thing I was going through, but anyway, that's probably not going to last long, it's kind of a little curiosity thing, Um, the interaction is small, but actually it's got a lot more plays and done a lot better than I thought it was going to, doing it that way, but if you really like it, share it with somebody and let them know, Um, today I'm going to talk about music, Um, this is a, a particular thing that I think I will probably end up doing over probably multiple times with multiple different people. It's just something that really, really interests me. Uh, music is huge with me, um, and I think it is with a lot of people. I mean, music is really impactful on people and on their lives, but it's really impactful a lot of times on your memories. And a lot of times, and I've talked about this with numerous people, me and my wife talk about it all the time. I've got friends I talk about it with, uh, you know, and it... I will hear a song, and I think a lot of people do this. You hear a song, and then it takes you back to a certain time and a certain place. That song reminds you of something in your past. Like the song is linked mentally to a memory. And, um, you know, it fascinates me how we we do that. You know, and I do that, I guess, somewhat with movies. Um, I think more... It's more vague to me with movies, uh, with the exception of some movies. Like, I have this weird habit. Every summer I watch the same set of movies. Every uh, Christmas I watch the same set of movies. Every Halloween I watch the same set of movies. I've got movies that um, they... Sorry, I had to cough. Uh, they remind me of a certain time of the year or whatever. And I, you know, um, it's probably pretty general movies for most people, except for the summer ones. You know, that's probably kind of odd for people. But I think a lot of people have certain Christmas movies, certain Halloween movies. But they kind of just take me back to a generalized thing. Um, a generalized time and place, not a specific time and place, you know, there's some movies, like the first time I seen, um, say, Crossroads, uh, a a movie that I'm going to talk about in this podcast, probably some, uh, with Ralph Macchio uh, from The Karate Kid, like, that takes me back to a very specific time and place, Um, first time, say, I watched um, SLC Punk, that takes me back to a very specific time and place, there are movies that do that, but a lot fewer movies. Movies have a different type of memory structure for me. I don't know. I mean, if it's different for you, if if movies give you kind of the same memory structures as songs, maybe this is something that's weird to me. Drop me an email at authorjperk at gmail.com or put it in the comments on the YouTube page. But, that you know, to me, music is, is more specific and more... Um, more condensed. Not all music, but some. I don't kind of have that with movies. I don't kind of have that with a lot of things. You know, you may have that with a certain event, like uh, Jordan winning a title, or, uh, you know, something of that nature, you know, of 9-11. But that's because that particular event came from a particular point in time. But music, music can be older music and still bring you to a newer memory. And and to me, or at least for me, music is very tightly uh, connected with memory. So I, I thought about all the different ways of really sitting and doing this. And I guess to me, like, kind of to do a chronological thing with music, like how far back I can go and what I remember and what a time at those two just kind of random things. And, you know, I was born in 82, so... I was a kid when MTV was getting up and going, and my mom listened to a lot of music. Um, my dad never really did, but my stepdad listened to a lot of music. 
Um, and so when I was really young and at home with mom, I, I can remember like mom having MTV on and, and stuff like that, or having the radio on in car in the car when we were going somewhere. So I can't give you the age, but it's just because I have a bad memory. But I have a very specific memory of having this like microphone you sing into with the guitar that's hooked to it and I was I was very young and Angel is a centerfold. Um I don't know if it was a newer song at the time, I don't know how long it had been out, but I would go around singing that song all the time, Jay Giles, Jay's Jay Giles band. So anytime I hear Angel is a centerfold with Jay Giles band, I think back to that. You know, and, and back to those M T V days, you know, I think of the Sledgehammer video and I think of um Genesis and when I hear those songs, it instantly takes me back to that point in time of being a kid. And even I can even remember some specific days. I can remember being home uh, in the summer, laying in my grandfather's floor uh, on my back, changing the channels on the TV with my toes, and uh, the Sledgehammer video being on. And, you know, I like, for some reason... When I hear that song, that memory cues up, and it's odd to me how music does that. You know, and when I was growing up, my grandfather had pool halls everywhere, or his stuff in other people's pool halls everywhere. But we had a pool hall right there at the house, you know, with a jukebox in it, and you know, there was a lot of older kids around. You know, kids that when I was eight, nine years old, they were already up into their mid to late teens. And, you know, that jukebox was constantly going. And, you know, White Snake, here I go again. Every time I hear that, I think of... And and the the pool hall swapped places. It was always moving. But every time I hear Here I Go Again by White Snake, I think of being in the pool hall that was closest to my grandfather's house it actually ended up being an apartment that my wife and i lived in when we first moved in together and there was a mike tyson punch out in there and i would go in after hours when it was locked up with my uncle's brother-in-law donnie ray and he would shoot pool and i would play tyson punch out and we would listen to that and i can remember specific nights and and what we talked about he was quite a bit older than me but you know he was super cool to me and I can remember specific nights of what we talked about on those nights and you know what all happened those nights and it's linked to that song and and hearing that song you know and and as I grew and even though my taste in music may have changed the um, the jukebox traveled with us from um different pool hall to pool hall and you know the ccr was constantly playing the acdc was constantly playing uh quite right we're not going to take it and anytime i hear those songs i think of specific pool halls which pool hall that song was played in like where the jukebox was when that song was played you know because we moved uh into different buildings you know the 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 pool hall moved over the years because it you know my grandfather originally owned a store and it was in the back of the store and then we moved it out of the store into its own building and then we built a building just for it like it 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 had some transitional periods where it moved from place to place so those songs kind of go hand in hand with the actual building it was in and up till that point up till probably I don't know, uh, let's say 10, I I think that music was just, it, it was affecting my memories, obviously, because I have these memories, and it just wasn't as important to me, I don't think. And, you know, every time I would sit down and try to make this list to do this, I would come back with something else and something else. And the list was so huge, I had to condense it, and I had to leave out a lot of things. But that, to me, really covers that first chunk of, of being younger. I mean, there there are songs um, that remind me of grade school and, and certain parts of grade school, but they're not as, as big a deal. It's coming up into 7th and 8th grade that it really starts to become more of a thing for me. I get, when I'm in 7th grade, this silver 
home stereo system. It's it even at that time is probably a fairly old stereo system. So I'm guessing this is 94ish sometime in there 94 95 that I got it. Uh, probably closer to 94. We just moved into our house had burnt. We'd lived in an apartment. We moved in. But um I get this this stereo. It's got a record player, uh, dual cassette, um, doesn't have a CD. Um, I think at the time I may have had like a small CD player, because I'd already had my first CD uh, by this point. Um, I traded for it. My buddy Eric had uh, um, a Leonard Skinner CD, uh, some basketball cards and something else, and I had a broke down mini bike, and we traded and so my grandfather had got a CD player and a pallet that kind of worked when it wanted to, skipped a lot, and, and that was my first CD player. So that happened actually before this. Uh, that summer, interestingly enough, before I got that first CD player, uh, we were living in an apartment, like I said, because my house had burnt down. And that summer, every time I hear Green Jelly, uh, uh, Three Little Pigs, uh, it makes me think of one specific summer day outside. Uh, I had a little tape player, and I had that tape, and listening to that tape uh, while I was playing outside. And also, um, any time I hear uh, it living on the edge, it reminds me of going to my cousin Sean's house, because he, he lived next to us while we were in that apartment at the time. And... That was on MTV on constant rotation, and I remember sitting in his living room specifically one day and listening to that song. I was a lot younger than him. I probably annoyed him immensely, but, you know, you obviously think everybody older than you is cooler than you, so, you know, you want to go hang out with him. But getting back to the to the the stereo, I first get the stereo, and like I said, my grandfather has jukeboxes everywhere, and so it has a record player. So... My first initial idea is I got to stock up some music because I have this this uh, big stereo now. And I always had a tape player. I would always record myself uh, doing different little skits and things like that, and that was the sole purpose of the tape player. Uh, occasionally, I would pop in a tape and listen to some music, especially after my my mom married my stepdad because he was big into music. And he had a killer tape collection, and he was kind of introducing to me stuff. To stuff slowly, you know, uh, Lover Boy, Van Halen, stuff like that. You know, he was getting me into that. Uh, you know, when I would ride somewhere with him, he'd put the tape in, and that, that's what we'd listen to. Uh, first CD player in a car that I really listened to to any amount was in his truck, and it was the same type of music. He transitioned immediately. He kind of put that tape collection aside, and I would get and go through it from time to time, and he was on to the CD collection. So I would borrow his tapes and stuff and, and listen on, on the tape player of this stereo. But I went to my grandfather's, and, and he, we had a bunch of stuff just kind of stored up. And um, there were some records there. And I found Eagle's Witchy Woman. I can't remember all the other albums I found in that first stash, but I know I found that. Because I can remember laying on, on my twin-size bed. Nobody else was home. I had the stereo cranked to see how loud it could go, listening to Witchy Woman, and, and just laying on my back, staring at the ceiling, you know, just just listening to that. And I can remember that. I can, I can remember the green and black uh, bedspread. I can, I can remember the ceiling. I can remember which... We had two bedrooms, and my brother and I would switch from time to time. One was smaller than the other. I was in the smaller bedroom at that time. Um... I can remember, I mean, I can I can remember I had a pair of red Chicago Bulls basketball shorts on. And when I hear that song, that memory floods back. It's a trigger. That song triggers that memory. And I'm endlessly fascinated by that. And <clears throat> many times I, I, I've sat and, and tried to figure out the value in that as, you know, an evolutionary value or a... a a survival value. I don't know what it is, but it is definitely very prevalent in me. And, you know, music 
remind me of generalized times or sections of life or specific memories. And to be honest with you, those specific memories seem to have a little less value sometimes than the generalized one. <clears throat> For example, in probably 7th grade, somewhere around that, um, maybe summer, going into 8th grade, uh, my my best friend Eric turned me on to uh, Jimi Hendrix. And any time I hear any Jimi Hendrix song, I think of Eric, and I think of first hearing Hendrix and first getting into Hendrix. And it was just this... I don't know. It was so different, and 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 Hendrix changed me in in a lot of ways. And Hendrix made me appreciate music, and it it took me from listening to music just for having something good to listen to because I enjoyed to listen to it, to really appreciating music and treating music as something, you know, of as an art form and looking at it differently, and and the way that Hendrix said things, and and the way that Hendrix. You know, his lyrics, his licks, everything changed that, you know. And I remember very specifically that change in myself. So Hendrix reminds me of that time period. You know, going into eighth grade and that change. Now, in eighth grade for Christmas, Except my grandfather had a store, and he was constantly buying these pallet things, and, and you know that's back. Everybody seems to do that now, but back then, you know, that was not something a lot of people had done. And a lot of times, things would pop up in his pallets that had no value to him, or, or things would come through that he'd get that really had no value to him. For example, you know, a computer he got me once; it had no value to him, but that was probably. You know, I could have been a three thousand dollar computer at that time when we got it, and I got it very early on in, in the the PC, kind of thing for me. But this year, he comes across some instruments. Um, he gets my little cousin Jonathan a black electric guitar, with an amp, and he gets me this black Gibson acoustic electric, um, just beautiful guitar and this amp um and as well you know he has this brand new in the box floor model big huge you know chest high speakers five disc cd changer dual cassette fisher stereo and to him it has no value to me, it's beautiful. I mean, it's brand new. This thing is state of the art, and it's beautiful. And so, I take it by default because he just has no interest in it. So, music really becomes important. My buddy Eric shows me Hey Joe on the guitar. Um, it's not the first song I learned, um, but it was a song that, you know, I was trying to learn to play bass, um, at the time, because um, I I didn't think, and I was correct in assuming that I was going to be a very good guitar player. So for just a second, I, I kind of messed with that notion, and this was more the the bass structure of that song than the actual song itself. And um, so every time I hear "Hey Joe," it makes me think of that first guitar and it makes me think of that day in my room in front of my new Fisher stereo listening to Hendrix and trying to play along with it and it makes me think of my friend Eric and so that one song will bring back everything that it just took me five six ten minutes whatever it was to tell you that one song brings all that back in a flood every time I hear it and this, you know, this big new Fisher stereo opened up a lot of things to me. Uh, you know, I got big into Eric Clapton. I got big into Cream. got big into this movie, Crossroads, because it was a blues movie. And I don't know how many times I've watched that movie, but this is one of those times when that movie will take me back more to a specific time. You know, uh, instead of a year or a decade, it'll take me back to a month span or a couple months. You know, it'll take me back to that. 
So, I'm big in the classic rock. I've got this big, huge stereo. One of my favorite things was sticking, taking on the back side of the stereo where the antenna input is. The antenna input has on that thing had an input like stereo wire, you know, two two sides. Well, my buddy Eric taught me that if you cut the end off of your TV cable that's coming to your room, and inside that you've got, you know, I don't know how coax cable's made now, but back then, I've not had a TV, I've not seen TV cable that long. That, that shows you what kind of progression we've made, <laughs> uh, technology-wise, but... You, you cut down that middle strand, that copper middle strand, and then you've got the little silver on the outside. If you stick the copper in the red side and the silver in the black or vice versa on the antenna input on the back. We lived in Knott County, Kentucky, in eastern Kentucky. But I could pick up radio stations from way down on Johnson City and stuff and get all these rock stations. And I did that forever. And I can't tell you when and what I heard first. But at one point, I was sitting there late one night, and I heard ZZ Top rhythming. And when I heard that, I fell in love with that song. And it got me just on a big ZZ Top kick, and I wanted that album. Uh, and, and, And so... I can tell you it was summer, my window was up, it was probably about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, all the lights in my room were off, I had the music turned down so I wasn't waking anybody up, and it was a Saturday night, and I was just laying there listening to music, and I remember that night specifically every time I hear rhythm it reminds me of that night. And that's phenomenal to me that that song etched that in my mind. And think back. Think, you know, as you're listening to this, I mean, think of a song. Think of a song that you have a real emotional attachment to that brings up one of those memories. Put it in the comments or email it. And, I mean, like I said, I don't know if anything else, because... Kind of the way I do these is I kind of isolate myself to think about that topic I'm going to talk about. And I really don't branch much further off from that because I don't want to kind of infect my head with anything else. But just as I was writing this out, you know, I don't, I can't think of anything that does me the way music does me. When I hear Fats Domino, Blueberry Hill, I think of being in my buddy Eric's trailer in his room, sitting on his bunk, bottom thing of his bunk bed, listening to that song and joking about that song. I can remember that day. When I hear Diablos and Musica by Slayer, that entire album, but especially Point, I'm in that same room. And he's convincing me that it's okay to listen to Slayer. And that's when I gave in and went, oh, okay, I can listen to this. Um, and that, that reminds me of that time. And those are, those are good memories. When we were younger, uh, one of the things, probably about 7th and 8th grade, well, it was 7th and 8th grade, one of the things that we really did for fun quite often was go to the skating rink and roller skate. Um, I loved rollerblading, roller skating, and I could actually do it. It's one of the few skills I ever had. I wasn't great at it, don't get me wrong, but I could actually do it. And there were always a lot of young girls there. You know, we were in seventh, eighth grade, and there was always a lot of girls there, and that was kind of our desire for going. My dad lived in Hazard, so when I would go to my dad's on the weekends, most weekends, I would take a friend, take her with me, and and me and him and my brother would go to the skating rink and just skate. And the whole time you're skating at the skating rink, this was at Fugit Skating Rink in Hazard, Kentucky. And the whole time you're skating, they're playing music, you know. I mean, that's, you know, the lights are down, you know, that's the atmosphere. And and I had, you know, I was making that transition in, into to heavier music and things like that. And I'd always somewhat been a Metallica fan. And, you know, every time I hear 
won by Metallica. I don't think of the video, even though if I sit down and think of it, I can remember the first time I seen the video. I can remember my cousin Brian talking about the song. Like I can, I have other memories associated with that song that just aren't as strong. When I hear the song "One," I immediately think back to that skating rink because that is something they played every Friday night. Every time I hear "California Love," uh, Tupac and Dr. Dre, I automatically think of that skating rink because that's something that they played every Saturday night. Um, I remember meeting certain people while certain songs were on. I remember meeting certain people while California Love was on. I remember uh, one night sitting up on the rail talking to some older kids that had went to grade school with us and now they were in high school. They were quite a bit older and and talking to them and hadn't seen them in a long time. And that night, uh, Nate Dogg and 1G Regulate uh, was on. You know, I, I that was one of my last memories of going to that skating rink. So, this place that I really loved going, and and these friends that I met, and and this really good time I had, I don't always think about that. And every time I drive by there, I don't think about it. And every time I go skating, I don't think about it. Which you know, and honestly, we don't hardly ever do anymore. You know, there's none of those places open. But every time I hear one of those songs that memory is brought back up it's stirred back up and you know it it's a testament to the power that music has over the human mind and how it influences us and that's why i say this won't be a one time topic and this won't be something that i can cover everything by myself because i think it affects everyone differently and and i it's it's one of those topics i love to discuss with people Um, because I think for the most part, it is something that really everyone, not everyone, but most people can, can identify with. Like I really, I know that my daughter has those songs that do those things for her. And I think a lot of times, even though we don't have the similar taste in music, that music is just as important to her as it is to me. Whereas with my wife, I know my wife has songs like that. Because we've spoken about it, but my wife, music doesn't mean as much to my wife as as it does to me. But even like music that I don't particularly like, when my daughter was younger, I didn't like for my wife and and her to go places, especially way off, with without me. So I've spent a lot of times either sitting outside of concerts I didn't want to go to, or being in concerts. I've been in two Rascal Flats concerts. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't enjoy Rascal Flats, and, and I'm not knocking them in any way. It's just not my thing. Uh, but any time I hear Rascal Flats, I automatically think of my wife and my daughter because I experience those things with them. And even though it, it, it don't have to be a specific song, uh, there's no forgetting that voice. So when you hear that voice, those voices, you you it it you instantly know who it is, and so it it takes it makes me think of them, or it makes me think of that concert with them. You know, one concert where I was holding my daughter up, and we were really close, and I was holding her up so that she could try to you know show them, you know, so that they could see her and stuff. Like it, it makes me think of that. Same way with boy bands, In um, Sync or Backstreet Boys. I can't tell them apart, but I don't need to. That makes me think of when my wife and I first started dating and joking with her over stuff. Just like if I ever hear Drops of Jupiter, it makes me think of my wife. If I ever hear Black Crows, it makes me think of my wife for the same reason. I almost didn't go out with my wife because she said that she got confused between the Black Crows and the band that sung Drop of, Drops of Jupiter. And I thought that that was blasphemous. There's no way I could date somebody like that. But we ended up getting married. So it, it it's amazing to me the impact that music can have. Um as I went into high school, uh, music took over my life. I mean, it, it took over my life. And I was still in this classic rock and, and metal kind of phase. And then I heard a band called Rage Against the Machine. And this this was, was different to me. And I, I'd heard about them. I'd been told about them. And my cousin Derek, 
is at the pool hall, and he's like, hey, man, I got a Rage Against the Machine CD. I'll see you for five bucks. I hate this. And I was like, all right, cool, you know, and I'll buy it. I bought the CD. It was Evil Empire. I walked straight across the road, straight into my room, sit straight down, and the first thing I heard coming out of my speakers was People of the, of the Sun. And I have never heard anything like this. This is so different to me. And it made me want to play bass. It wanted me to, made me want to play music. And it made me want to think when I listened to music. Whether I agreed with what somebody said or not, at least I had to think about it. So when I think when I hear People of the Sun or I hear Rodeo or Boomerang or I hear um, in anything off that album, especially Bulls on Parade, I think of being in my room that time um, and I always think of that same little chunk of time from this transition from classic rock, which I never left, but into this, what eventually got called new metal. Because Rage Against the Machine was this new thing. You know, I remember going to a local show, watching a local band that had a guitar player named Big E, and he would come to the the pool hall on and off. And by this time, we were already big into new metal. We were big into corn. We were big into all this. And me and my buddy Eric went to this show called The Modern Rock Revival. He's a local radio host. Trevor Huff put it on. His band played. A band, I think maybe Sonic Joyride or something like that played that night. But this other band played. And I cannot, I believe their name was Breach. Uh, I can't remember because I have a horrible memory. But music helps me remember a lot of things. I remember watching them do... Raising some machine covers and watching this guy named Big E play this white Ibanez. And the next time we caught him at the pool hall, me and Eric were like, Show us something. Show us a Rage Against the Machine. And he showed us the first Rage Against the Machine song that we had ever learned how to play. And it was Killing in the Name of. And so every time I hear Killing in the Name of, I think of sitting in my grandfather's backyard. On a dirt jump, we dirt jump. We jumped BMX bikes and, and sitting on a dirt jump with an acoustic guitar, learning how to drop detune and learning how to play "Killing in the Name of." And I say learning. Eric was learning, and I was glad that Eric was learning because I was confused because I was always confused. And this instantly got us into we have to start a band and we have to play Rage Against the Machine and. Um, that later happened on down the road, but you know, every time I hear Rage Against the Machine, I think of that guy that I don't really know. He was nice to us, he was older than us, super cool dude, I, I don't really know him. But his name was Big E, that's what I know about him. I remember that white Ibanez with, with the pit guard um, and all that, and, and I remember that day in my grandpa's backyard learning that song, you know. And then I remember sitting at my dad's house and learning the bass line for Killing in the Name of on an acoustic guitar with Eric. And, you know, every time I hear that song, that period of time and those memories pop up. And it's a good feeling. It makes me feel good. And, you know, I love the song. I love it for that reason because it brings back that memory. Um, after Rage Against the Machine and and those things happened, I guess the obvious progression was Corn, and Corn is one of the bands that has the biggest impact on my memory. That first album changed the way I thought about things, the way I dressed, um, what I'd done with my free time. You know, my free time was um, probably 40%, 50% music. I mean, that's that's to say that every hour of the day, 40% of it before corn was spent on 
music, and 60% of it was spent on something else. After corn, no matter what I was doing, even if it was doing something else, music become a focus of that. And every time I hear that first corn album, I think of that probably first three months that I had it. And it encompasses so many memories. I think of uh, sitting in my room and listening to that album all the way through the first time. I think of the first time I listened to Daddy. first time I listened to Daddy and, and heard him crying and, and read the lyrics and, and understood what the song was about was probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning sitting with uh, just amazement on my face and, and sitting and listening to this song in my room on that Fisher stereo turn down because everybody's asleep you know and I remember that night specifically and that album makes me think of that time period specifically every time that album comes on I think of that time period and what was going on in my life and and how my life was different and you know all those things all those things work together um, after the first album, second album came out, and, you know, by this point I was somewhat into the band, or I was very into the band, but it was the third album. You know, when this album came out, my friends were into it, I was into it, um, but every time I hear Follow the Leader, any song off that album... It reminds me of that winter. Um, it reminds me of parties and being at my buddy's house and and listening to that album, listening to it, trying to recreate those guitar sounds all day on these winter days. We snowed out of school. We were off for Christmas break. We spent every day except for Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and one other day at his house. And it was constantly trying to to figure out the, the parts of these songs. And, and I remember what I got for Christmas that year. I got a new Ibanez bass for Christmas that year from my dad. I got pedals from my mom. Trying to recreate these sounds. I got... I went to a pawn shop and found this blue Ibanez guitar. And my buddy Eric had found this black RG style Ibanez guitar. And... I remember just sitting and working feverishly on trying to trying to to create these recreate these sounds and 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 mimic this music and it become an obsessive compulsion to a large degree and you know um at that point really in my life like I was listening to a lot of music but Deftones and Corn were were it and you know when it's summertime and it's hot and I'm driving down the road and the window's down to this day, you know, that that was in the late 90s. It's 2020. I'm probably listening to Deftones because a summer day, warm winds, window down, that reminds me of the Around the Fur album. And it always takes me back to that. And every winter, if it's snowy and cold, and I'm kind of just driving along in my vehicle thinking... I instantly put on Follow the Leader, and I'm taken back to that winter. And those things are a constant, you know. It's ever-changing, and um, there's always a song popping up. You know, I've got thousands of songs on my iPod, and there's always a song popping up that takes me somewhere. And, you know... I sent a video off YouTube to my buddy Mandy the other day, and it was Limp Biscuit from from you know doing Party Like It's 1999, doing the 1999 cover from that New Year's. Every time it's New Year's, that's what I think of. You know, I'm not a huge Limp Biscuit fan. I'm not big on New Year's. You know, I don't really get into celebrating New Year's. I usually got to work the next day. I don't party and stuff. I used to when I was younger, but that's what I think of on New Year's. Every New Year's. You know, it's just one of those things. And, and it, every year it's kind of, it comes in kind of like an order, you know. you I'm 
big on corn through December, and it and it it kind of sets that mood. I listen to a lot of other stuff in there. It's not that it's the only thing I'm listening to, but it will be often my go-to, especially follow the leader. And it instantly takes me back to that point in time of when that in in when that album meant the most to us, and it was that winter and 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 doing that, you know. And then New Year's will come by, and it's instantly into Limp Biscuit. You know, I may not even listen to it a lot, but New Year's will remind me of that song, even though I don't listen to that song very often. Probably listened to it four times since that night, but it's burning my head. Them doing it live on MTV, you know. Um, and then as you go into spring, you know, I'll. There's no big chunks of time there that really remind me of any music. So I'll listen to different songs, and different songs will take me back to different times. And uh, the way this system is set up, I'm about to run out of time on this recording, so this episode will be in two parts, hopefully put together. I don't know. I've never tried this, so we'll have to see. So this will be the end of part one, and hopefully we'll just come straight back into part two. We'll have to wait and see.